We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today. Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20 as we turn in there. I uh, just wanted to ask you a question. Did you know this morning, it's still on the books, in Massachusetts, it is illegal to drive with a gorilla in your back seat? <laughs> now, that's the truth. Uh, don't be doing that. A good call. In South Dakota, it's illegal to fall asleep in a cheese factory. I wonder what the story is behind that one. In Chicago, if you're going to the opera, you're not allowed to bring your French poodle. In Delaware, it's illegal to get married on a dare. By the way, you shouldn't get married just because one dared you to, um, but it's illegal in Delaware. In California, you cannot eat oranges while sitting in your bathtub. No idea. And in Georgia, a little bit more local, more close to home, it's against the law to walk around with an ice cream cone in your back pocket. How many of you tried that? All right. As absurd as these laws might sound to us uh, in these days, there was once upon a time where the circumstances demanded society to write those laws uh, for a specific reason. Now, for example, the ice cream cone law, and you know, you can't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket. Sounds crazy, right? But here's why they wrote the law. Horse thieves figured out they could get away with stealing horses without even touching the horse. By putting an ice cream cone in their back pocket, the horse would follow them home. And so the law caught on to this. The lawmakers said, okay, you can't have an ice cream cone in your back pocket. Uh, that's just what they did at that time. But when you take laws out of context, when you take them out of what their setting is, they might sound ridiculous. They might, uh, you, you, you remove them from the story of the community and they sound absurd to us. But laws exist for this reason. They exist to guide and protect us. That's why laws exist. Now, the Old Testament law can make our heads spin sometimes with, with all the demands and all the commands and uh, yeah, you look at some of the things that exist in there, the laws about you can't eat shellfish and uh, the clean and unclean distinctions and all the laws regarding the sacrifices. And we can go on and on and on this morning uh, with the Old Testament laws. But Christians have primarily responded to the Old Testament law in two ways. The first way is Christians by and large just ignore it. Uh, though we don't, we're New Testament Christians, we're New Covenant Christians, we don't have to deal with uh, the Old Testament law at all. So we ignore it altogether, or we try to keep it to prove ourselves worthy to God in some way. And I would say this morning that both of those extremes are wrong. You know, there's no way we can prove ourselves worthy to God by keeping the law. Now, what about Jesus? This morning we're going to talk about what Jesus said about the law, how he handled the law, <laughs> what he did with the law, and what does it mean for us this morning? So if you look in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, of course, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments, and Jesus uh, addresses some of those commandments here, especially the last uh, of the five there. But he says here, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one iota, not one dot will pass away from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless the righteousness, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, that he came to fulfill the law. That's what he said in verse 17. And yet, at the same time, he urged his followers to practice that law and to teach the law, verse 19. And he says we have to do it with a righteousness that ex exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, I talked about this a little bit with, the, with our Sunday school class a few weeks ago, but... Can you imagine for a moment being in that audience in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching there on the mountain, 
And he says, your righteousness has to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, in the minds of the public, there were no more righteous people than the scribes and the Pharisees. They knew the law forwards and backwards. They know all the Bible. They, they had it memorized by heart. They can interpret the law. They lived, in their minds, exemplary lives. And here's Jesus saying, unless you supersede them, unless your righteousness passes them, then you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. So what does that tell us? According to the law, it's impossible to keep it. It's impossible to to live a sinless life outside of Jesus Christ. It is absolutely, we're incapable of doing that. That's what Jesus is saying there. And it would have shocked everybody to hear those words. So let's look at what, what exactly does Jesus mean by all that. First, we see that Jesus did up, uphold the law. He didn't come in and say, you know what? You, you have this law before you, let's just throw it out. You don't have to pay attention to it anymore. He said he upheld it. He respected the law. And Matthew 5 opens the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus shattered all these assumptions of his hearers. You know, they assumed one thing, they had heard one thing, and Jesus said, well, here's what the real truth is about who is righteous and who is blessed and what God expects from his people. In verses 3 through 12, we see what is commonly called the Beatitudes, the blessings of Jesus pronounces these blessings on, on certain types of people. And he says, the blessed are the poor and the needy and the meek and the persecuted, the peacemakers, the suffering, uh, those who are, are, who are you know, suffering for Christ's name. He says, these are the people that are blessed. And it's a stunning reversal of the way the people understood the world at that time. It completely changed everything in their mindsets. And most people believe something like this, you know. You can change the words a little bit, but here's what most people in the world believe. If we do good things, then good things are going to happen to us. Now, that's stated in various ways. Um, we hear the word karma tossed around quite a bit. I mean, it's everywhere. But if I do good things, then good things are going to happen to me. Or we can restate that. If we do good things, God owes us a blessing. That's just popular belief. It might be health or it might be wealth. It might just be plain happiness. But we tend to think that we can earn or we can deserve God's blessings and God's favor on us by our religious obedience. I need to tell you this morning that, that is not the case. In fact, God owes you nothing. But he willingly, he freely gives us his grace and all these blessings. The Beatitudes put an end to all that idea. And the rest of Jesus' sermon disrupts all kinds of ideas about what religion is and what law is and what obedience looks like. And so he looked at the law of murder. And Jesus connected, you shall not murder. And he took that murder and he, he equated it with hatred. He made it a heart issue. It's not just a physical issue, it's a heart issue. He did the same thing with adultery. It goes back to the heart. It goes back to the mind. And you know what? Basically, we cannot skate past the Ten Commandments. And we can't congratulate ourselves for not killing someone or not robbing a bank or something like that because even, Jesus says, our daydreams haunt us and condemn us. Now, we can see Jesus' life and his teaching as being perfectly obedient to the law. He kept the law. He upheld the law. There's nothing in it that he broke. Even when the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and religious leaders came along and said, well, why are you breaking the law? And Jesus had to correct them. I'm not breaking the law. I'm breaking your tradition. This is something that you came up with. This never came from, from God. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, we're reminded that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we need to, we need to be reminded of that, because a lot of times we think Jesus, uh, being the Son of God, was not tempted like we are, and he didn't have to face the things that we face on a daily basis. But it says there in Hebrews that Jesus was tempted in every single way that we are. There's just one difference. 
He didn't fall to the temptation. He never sinned. Jesus' life and teaching is also uh, the law's fullest and the clearest revelation to us from God. Not only did Jesus up, uphold the law and keep the law perfectly, but he even went so far as to say, the law is about me. The law is about Jesus. That's what he's saying. All the law and all the prophets point to me. That's what Jesus was saying there. And to be fair, he can say that. He can make that claim. Being God, he wrote the law. It is his to begin with. And it's fair to say that no one in history has cared more about the law than has Jesus Christ. Because it's his. The law is actually about him. He makes this point in John chapter 5. He says in verse 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. So the, the religious leaders in that day, they thought they were on a path and they thought they were being obedient to God. And they thought they were living righteous lives and they thought that they were going to live forever because they kept the word of God. Jesus says, you misunderstand the whole point of the Bible. They're about Jesus. John 5, verse 46, 4. If you believed Moses, you would believe me. For Moses wrote about me. You now, in their minds, there was no greater prophet. There was no greater person in history than Moses. They held Moses up on a high pedestal. In fact, you go to their synagogues and they had a seat where the teacher would sit. And they named that seat the seat of Moses. They lifted Moses up on high. Jesus said, you don't understand Moses at all. Moses wrote about me. Jesus warned that we should not misunderstand the law, nor should we miss the whole point of the law. The law has always been about the heart. It's always been about the way God has intended us to live our lives. And the law never leaves us with clean hands. You go up against the law, guess what's going to win? The law is going to win every time. And it's an objective reminder to us that we are broken creatures with no hope on our own. Uh, no hope of pleasing God. And I haste to say on our own, because we do have hope. We do have someone who has made it right and has fixed our brokenness. His name is Jesus. And the good news is that Jesus said he fulfills the law. That's good news for you and for me this morning, that Jesus fulfills the law. Romans 10 verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone who believes. Good news. Jesus fulfilled the law. He's what the law is all about. He is the very end of the law. And he says, For anyone who believes, it is righteousness. What does that mean for us? So the law comes at us like a blaring announcement declaring to everyone who hears it, you are guilty before God. But in Christ, because Christ fulfilled the law and he went to the cross on our behalf and he took our place and he's exchanged what we call that great exchange. He's our great substitute. He bore our sins. He bore our shame. And in exchange, he gave us his righteousness. He gave us his cover. His precious blood covers all of our sins by our belief in him, he says. This belief leads to righteousness because we have trusted in what he has done. Now, Jesus stands between us and the law. He stands between us and that declaration that we have fallen short of God's glory. In fact, he ends the accus accusations entirely. The law is accusing us and Jesus said, stop. No more, because Jesus perfectly kept the law in our place. And like I said, that is great news. That is good news. Now, we might be tempted to just, like I said, just, okay, well, if that's the case, then let's just dismiss the law altogether. Why do we need it? But that would be very damaging to our Christian walk. There still is a purpose for the law. And we see that in verse 19 where Jesus talks about fulfilling the law, but he did so in order to enable our obedience. So now the law is not something that's standing up and condemning us. Now the law is an invitation to us to live the life that God wants us to live. 
Look at verse 19 again. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever, listen, whoever does them and whoever teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Well, to understand what Jesus is saying here, we need to remember that first and foremost, he has fulfilled the law in its entirety. From the greatest law to the least, he's fulfilled. And an amazing thing happens once the law has been fulfilled for us. Our relationship with the law has been transformed. It's been changed. Okay. Instead of the impossible demand, Jesus' statement here gives us an invitation. Now we are enabled to obey God. Now we're enabled to live for God, where before that relationship was broken. And the, where the law once declared us dead and condemned in our sins, in Jesus it now stands as a new and transformed light for us. It's the mind of God. It's the revelation of God to us. It's a light foreshadowed by Jeremiah the prophet. In Jeremiah 31 verse 33, he says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah looked forward to that day that we enjoy now. And Paul described this transformation in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. If you just go there real quick, Romans chapter 6, verses 11 through 14. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Did you notice there's a difference now. We're no longer under law, we're now under grace. Which one's more demanding? Ooh, trick question, right? Where the law says you only have to give to God 10%, grace demands all of it. We're all to be uh, instruments of worship to God. So in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, Jesus has fulfilled the law's obligations. And it cannot condemn us anymore once we are in Christ. Once we're in him and we're identified with him. You think about, uh, how many of you like Finding Nemo? Remember that movie? Such a funny movie, right? But think about that clownfish. That clownfish is stuck in a, a dingy tank in a dentist office, right? And that's, that's his world. That's all he knows. But what if that clownfish got out of that tank and was suddenly placed around the Great Barrier Reef and a whole sea of life has opened up to him? Now, what would you think? What would you think about that clownfish if he took around and uh, look around at all the life that's now his world and looked it right in the face and said, you know what? I don't like this. I'm going to go back to the tank. I'm going to go back to this green stuff that I'm used to. I'm going to go back to this horrible, horrible little world because I just can't handle this. What would we think of that fish? Like, what is wrong with you? You have everything before you now. Don't go back. That's what Paul was saying there in Romans. He says, once you have tasted God and seen that he is good, once you've experienced his grace, once you've seen that the law no longer condemns you but is now there because you have this relationship with Jesus Christ, he says, look, we are now transported into that great new world. Don't look back. Don't try to get back into it. And the law remains. Yes, it beckons us to this life in the Lord. It's an invitation to the good life. Life as God intends it, intends it to be lived. Now, as Christians, then, we find ourselves both invited and we're empowered to obey God 
without the burden, this is the good news, without the burden of condemnation that comes with it. Because now it's not, it's not about our work, is it? It's all about the work of Jesus Christ. And so in Jesus, we are provided with the power and the ability to follow him. And that's what Paul means when he says that we are alive to God. We're dead to sin now. We're alive to God. Good news? It's fantastic news. And I encourage you to live each and every day just basking in the joy that comes with that relationship with Jesus Christ. Never take that for granted. And it is awesome. It's awesome to think about. It's awesome to behold. But it's even more glorious to live that out. You know, so what is it today? Here's your homework. What is it that God is calling you to do? And what excuses are have you been given to God why you haven't done it? Just know that God is not condemning you. God is inviting you. Step forward in faith and live your life what he wants you to do. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for this great reminder from Jesus, your son, who tells us that he has fulfilled the law. And it's not about our works, but it's all about what he accomplished for us. And Father, now we can just live our lives in all of that, but uh, to move forward with obedience. And uh, Father, whatever it is that you're laying on our hearts, may we just step out in faith and obey you. <coughs> I pray that for each and every one of us in Christ's name. Amen.